First Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, we are going rather slowly through First Peter, and he does deal a lot with sufferings, and so we're exhausting this idea of how we suffer as Christians, how we're tested, or we go through fiery trials. And this morning, he's going to talk about fiery trials that we, we go through <clears throat> and how they relate to the sufferings of Christ. If you're going to be used by God, he will take you through a number of experiences that are not meant for you personally at all. It was Oswald Chambers that wrote, they are designed to make you useful in his hands, to enable you to understand what takes place in the lives of others. So according to him and his experiences, the sufferings that we endure are not for us personally. They're to make us usable for God so that we, what is that? (laughs) So that we can minister to others by the sufferings that we have gone through and been comforted by. And Paul's going to talk about that today as I reference Corinthians. So let's let's just kind of build upon these two verses and just remind ourselves the context. In in chapter 4, verse 7, he reminded us that the end of all things was coming. And as we see uh, the signs today of what's taking place in our world, we see that it's getting close. It's getting close. I like the analogy uh, of... uh, Christmas. How do you know when Christmas is coming? Because right around um, Halloween, they start setting up the Christmas ornaments and the trees and all those things. So you see the signs of Christmas coming months before Christmas is even here. Or Easter, you know, it's coming real soon because they have all the eggs, the chocolates, the baskets out. So, you know, Easter's coming really soon. So we see the signs of the end is coming because we see around us some of the signs that are taking place. And so Peter encourages us to be serious, first of all, in our faith in our relationship with Christ, and to be watchful, keep an eye on things, and then to be in prayer always. And then he encourages in in verse 8 through 11 to love one another while we're waiting for his return and to use the gifts that God has given us for the glory of God as Christ used the gifts for his glory. And then we come to verses 12 and 13, and we see the glory of of his or the joy of his glorious coming let's read verses 12 through 13 beloved do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you as though some strange thing happens to you but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed you may also be glad with exceedingly joy so Peter here starts off with the word beloved in verse 12 Let me exhaust that a little bit. I don't know what your perspective is upon pastors, upon those who teach the word of God. I don't know if you understand the love that they have for you when they teach the word of God to you. Here we see the word beloved used. Peter is using that word beloved towards the believers that are suffering. In the Greek, when you look up the word, it it all kind of correlates with the word agape, which is unconditional love. And it's only born of the Spirit that we have unconditional love. That's, that's not something that we gain in our own human strength. We have conditions when we love, usually. If they do this, then I will love them. If they can do that, then I will love them more. And if they behave themselves, I will love them even more. You know? And so we set conditions on our love. But this love that Peter is expressing here is one born of the Spirit. Only the Spirit can give it. And the Spirit has given this type of love to obviously Jesus Christ, to the disciples, and to those that teach the word of God from a sincere heart. And so the term here is a term of endearment, to someone that uh, you are deeply devoted to. Now understand that Peter is speaking to the saints, and these saints are suffering. He's never met them. This is a church that's been scattered abroad. He's never really met them personally, hasn't sat down to dinner with them, hasn't had a conversation, they don't have cell phones that they can talk to, you know, hello, hey, how you doing, like to really encourage you, you know, that type of thing, they don't, they don't have those things at that time, so what does Peter do, he writes a letter, an epistle, and he writes this letter to the church, 
uh, because he loves them. He cares about them. He's not receiving anything from them. He's not expecting them to send a donation through the mail. You know, he's not expecting to, to, for them to write back and say we were encouraged. He's just writing out of love for God and for the saints because they are going through horrific things at this time. They're being persecuted. So Peter has this love for the saints, and it's a love that's instilled in his heart from Jesus Christ. How do you explain that kind of love from Peter's perspective? Here was a man who walked with Jesus for three years, and he saw the love of Jesus Christ. He saw how he loved the people, how he fed the people, how he took care of the people, how he healed the people. But more than anything else, he saw how he fed the people with the word of God, with scripture with illuminating their understanding of who God is and what God has done. He loved them enough to share the truth with them, taking the Old Testament all the way up until Malachi and revealing it all, illuminating their hearts to Jesus Christ and what he was going to do on the cross. I have had mentors in my life that have mentored me personally in my Christian walk. Uh, One mentor that I hold up very highly is Pastor Chuck Smith. Now, I have never sat down and, and literally at his table and, and have eaten with him. I've sat in conferences where he's been in the room with a table of, of close friends. You know, that's as close as I, I've been to him. I have talked to him. I spoke to him on the phone at, at length concerning this church, concerning the building. And he gave me some wisdom and direction and offered some uh, possibilities and, and, and so forth. So at length, that was probably our longest conversation um, spoke to him at a pastor's conference, told him exactly what happened with the church, the building, and he was just rejoicing. I mean, he, he really has never met me before that, uh, doesn't know who I am really, and yet he was rejoicing with me that, that the Lord just took care of the building and now we own the building and how the Lord has blessed us and so forth, and he was rejoicing. But what I do remember the most is that Pastor Chuck has taught me the word of God taught me the word of God, not personally, but on the radio. When I got saved, I turned on to K-Wave 107.9, and I was able to hear him every single day. In fact, twice a day while I was working for Southern California at 7 o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock at noon, and if I worked late, I'd hear him in the evening also, the same message. And I was able to glean from what he has taught from the scriptures for my own life. And I believe that that's the ultimate type of love. He's never, you know, come up to me and hugged me, never expressed some emotional, you know, feelings towards me, and I haven't towards him, but yet I know that he loves me because he was willing to teach the word of God to me, and it's equipped me. That's the kind of pastor, leader, teacher that you want, one that is willing to teach the word of God above all things. He might have personality flaws, which I do. (laughs) He might not be perfect, which I'm not. You know, he might not even speak well, which I don't, you know, but he teaches the word of God. His heart is to see people grow in the word of God, that they would take the word of God simply, simply put and receive it into their own hearts and then live that out in their own lives so that the glory belongs to the Lord. That's the heart of a pastor. That's the heart of Peter here, is that he loved these people enough to teach them, to tell them the truth. In the context here of First Peter, and even in the New Testament, this agape love, which speaks of God's divine and infinite love for us, and ultimately it's a love that, that watches out for a person's spiritual well-being because of love. And so, in a sense, Peter has this divine love for these saints. And every pastor's challenge with that personally, as I read this, I asked myself, am I teaching the word of God, simply teaching it? Not not getting too deep into it that it just goes over your head. Now, there are some pastors like that where it just goes over your head. And like, what did they say? Relativism? And what does that mean, you know? And, and all these terms, eschatology, and, you know, and, and terms that just don't, mean anything without the definition of them all and it can just go over your head. I don't know if you ever heard Chuck Missler. Chuck Missler is just a tremendous teacher, very intelligent uh, naval officer and um, when he teaches, he teaches way up here. And sometimes you're like following along and next thing you know, you're like, okay, he lost me. 
I am, I'm gone. I don't even know what he said. I've got to get the tape. got to listen to it over and over again. And sometimes he even takes you on this little rabbit hole, and then he just drops you there and says, okay, figure out the rest for yourself. You know, and it's just, that's the type of stuff that, that he, he does because that's the kind of teacher he, he is. But Chuck has done it so that he just puts it right on the table for you. You know, for me, it would be beans and rice with some carne asada. That's, that's simple, and that's something I'm used to, you know. Potatoes and, and, and gravy and, you know, that shredded beef stuff, ugh, I don't like that. And that's a little hard for me. But that's how Chuck was, and that's how a pastor should be. I was speaking with uh, a pastor not too long ago. <clears throat> He's an evangelist, and he was sharing with me a struggle that... Uh, the Lord has revealed in his own heart because he was an evangelist he was going out to evangelize at other churches at other outreaches even even other nations uh, mission fields and so forth and he was leaving his church behind so on Sunday morning someone else was teaching and he said that the Lord was really convicting his his heart that he wasn't teaching his own flock that, that actually it felt better going somewhere else because when he went somewhere else and people were saved and acknowledged the gospel they would come up afterwards and kind of pat him on the back and say good message and you know that was wonderful and look at the crowds of people that responded to it and so forth and he was living off of that and I remember what Pastor Chuck had taught years ago in a message where he said as a pastor you have to feed your flock you have to be faithful with the people that God has given to you to feed and so I reminded him of that and it was uh, a neat time of fellowship and he said that's some, something that I need to start implementing again is, is being able to come home and feed my flock someone had asked me recently <clears throat> if I would like to teach on a Sunday morning at their church, well, they went and did something, probably teach somewhere else. And I says, well, I don't want to leave my flock. You know, I'm called to teach them, and so I will be there Sunday morning. If it's another day, another night, that would be no problem. But on Sundays, I want to feed the ones that God has entrusted to me, the simple word of God. <clears throat> That's the heart of a pastor. Not a heart of evangelist, it's different. So within the context here, we see that, that Peter has this deep love for the suffering sheep of the Lord. Now, and there's more to being a pastor than, than just loving the people and feeding them the word. We'll see in chapter 5, verse 1, it talks about the elders among them and how he exhorts them to be witnesses of the sufferings of Christ and partakers of the glory that's going to be revealed in there to shepherd the flock, verse 2, of God, which is among them as overseers. And so there's also a shepherding that takes place with the pastors, but we'll look at that in a couple of weeks. Paul told young Timothy, also as a young pastor, he, he told him to be an example in chapter 4, verse 12, be an example to the believer in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So as a pastor, we are to lead the flock by example. We are to be the ones that are showing them how to do it and not necessarily telling them to do it, but leading them to do it. I love doing that because I'm a servant. God has given me a heart to be a servant, and most of the people here in the church are servants. We have a heart to serve people. You have guys here that are single, <clears throat> that are married, and they serve. When there's an event, they're here. They usually set up, and they also tear down. And events that have nothing to do with the, with the church oftentimes, uh, they've been at weddings, they've helped set up, they've helped tear down, and they don't even know the people. You know, I mean, this is the heart that they have to serve. And it comes from being led by example. Uh, I was out in the yard one day, and someone drove by, and, and they saw the work that was going on, and they were appreciative of it of it all because they live in the community here and they want to see stuff like this and so he wanted to make a donation and so he says where's the pastor and so I come walking up and I says I'm the pastor and he looked at me he goes no you're not I'm like yeah I'm the pastor he goes you don't look like a pastor because I was out there working with them you know and it surprised him that you would be out there working the neighbor next door all of a sudden she's uh, Asian so she comes up pastor are you a good pastor I'm like I'm a good pastor okay well, you've never heard me teach. No, I know you're a good pastor. I'm like, really? How do you know? Because you're working out there with them. Because the pastors I know, they don't work. They just go in the pulpit and teach. You know? I'm like, wow, I never thought of that. You know? That's leading by example. And I'm not patting myself on the back. That is the way it should be according to Scripture. 
And so he's telling the believers, or Timothy here, that he needs to lead that way. But not just in his example, in his life, but also giving attention to reading to, of the Word of God, attention to doctrine. And I really believe, above all things, that is the most important, is that a church teach the Word of God. We have too many churches that are not teaching the Word of God. They're teaching other things. And I've shared this with you recently. As we look at the end of the times, that one of the uh, signs is apostasy, the church falling away from the word of God. They're no longer believing that this is the word of God. There's more to the word of God. There's other documents. There's other information. There's other wisdom, and that we really don't need the word of God because it's archaic. It was for then, and it's not for now. And so we need to push it aside in a sense because it's not relevant for today. And yet Paul told Timothy, pay attention to reading and exhortation and doctrine. And so truly a a pastor, a teacher, an overseer, an elder who has love and a heart for people will be one that leads them in the word of God. That is so important. Why would you want his wisdom? Why would you want man's wisdom? Look at where man is today, even the president of the United States and where he's led us to. And we need to pray for him. But if that's the highest of wisdom that we have, we're in trouble. What we need is God's wisdom from his word being taught. And we need to get back to the simplicity of the word of God. We really do. And we need more of that. And so Peter then, sharing with them his heart, that they're beloved, they're loved by him, he then comforts these believers. Another, Another evidence of a good pastor is that he comforts his sheep. He's there for them to encourage them and to strengthen them in their walk. And there are many that are hurting, that are suffering for various reasons. We had a healing service here Friday night while we've been meeting every night at 7 o'clock in the upper room here. And it was just such a beautiful time of healing. And it wasn't necessarily healing from some sickness, but even healing of the heart because our hearts have been broken. Our hearts have been um, crushed by people by maybe pastors uh, in relationships and so it was just such a neat time to see people uh, come to the lord broken and then the lord just restoring their hearts and their faith and their trust in him it's beautiful and so that's so comforting to see take place within the body of christ and so peter is comforting them now while they're suffering he says do not think it's strange in the next statement concerning the fiery trials which is to try you as though some strange thing is happening to you don't think it's strange don't think that it's a weird situation why is this happening to me it happens to everybody nothing new is under the sun we all go through trials and testings and sufferings and so even though they're fiery trials and you almost get the picture of the three hebrew boys right and they're thrown into the fiery oven And it is literally a fiery trial, and yet Jesus is in the midst with them. Now, Peter says, which is to try you. Those trials are for you. They're to test you, your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ, to see how strong you are, to see how weak you are. They're there to perform certain things in your life so that God can use you in other ways. So he's issuing basically a command here. In the Greek, it's a present imperative, which which means that it's negative. It implies that they are, in fact, surprised by these fiery trials. Uh, That's a young believer, someone who really hasn't experienced the persecution of their faith. Uh, They come to the Lord and they're excited and they're saved and and everything is working wonderfully and great. And then then all of a sudden a trial comes and they're like, what? What happened here? I thought everything was going to be okay from this point on. I wasn't going to have any more problems and no more suffering. And all of a sudden, here I am. I'm in a pit. And this is a strange thing for me to enter into at this time. And Peter says, "Don't, uh, don't entertain that. No, it's not something that that is strange, but it's something that does happen to us. But why does it happen? Why does it take place? Why do we go through fiery trials? As I said earlier, one reason is is that um, God is preparing us to be used of him for others' sake, and we'll see that in a moment. But also understand that fiery trials are here because of a result of man's sin. 
Because Adam partook of the fruit that he was not supposed to. And thus sin entered into the world and suffering entered into the world. We just recently saw that movie Unstoppable out there in the yard. And he put it very well that it was, it was the fall of man that caused suffering to enter into the world. And that we should not focus on the suffering of man but on the mercy and the grace of God. That's what we should focus on. That God is so merciful and so gracious towards us even though we messed up, we sinned against him, could not keep his commandment, yet he still loves us. Yet he still gives us eternal life. Yet he he still blesses us and takes care of us. And so we should focus on those things and not necessarily on the trials and the sufferings that we endure. I like the way John Corson put it. He says, why do good people suffer? And he basically says, because there are no good people. There are no good people. We're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. It's what the Bible teaches. We've, we've all missed the mark. That's what the word sin means. We've broken God's commandments. Have we all loved God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength? No. Have you ever told a lie? Yeah. Have you ever cheated? Yeah. Yeah. Have you committed adultery? Well, no, I've never done that. But spiritually in your heart, have you? You know, yeah. We have. We've coveted our neighbor's goods. We haven't kept the Sabbath holy. You know, we've all failed in God's eyes, and yet he still loves us. He still protects us. He's, he's still there for us. And so it was Adam's sin that brought suffering, and it will be Jesus' resurrection that brings healing to us one day. And we need to focus on the resurrection of Jesus Christ because sin because of sin, we experience the sickness, the pain, the death. And then it might not be because of us, but just the result of sin. We, we might not have a personal input there, but because of sin, we suffer too. Not of our fault. It's just part of the fall. And so <laughs> Christ died in order to put to end such things. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 15. Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, that is Adam, by man also came the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. So it's in Christ Jesus. So his mercy, his grace, that's our hope while we're suffering. Don't think it's strange. Just trust in the Lord. Have hope in Christ. And what he has done. And then verse 13, he says, also rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Now that's an interesting phrase. Rejoice because we partake of Christ's sufferings. What is he saying there? What does he mean there? I'm going to spend some time here. The Christian who is persecuted in their faith is a partaker of some kind of sufferings of Christ. Well, have I suffered like Christ? No, not even near what Christ has suffered. Just looking at the cross, the nails and the thorns, I, I haven't gone through that. I may have stepped on a nail and we'll get a tetanus shot from the doctor, but that's the worst that it's been. I didn't suffer that or even my own sins. Yeah, I have to deal with my own sins, the repercussions for whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. But the sins of my neighbor, the sins of the world, were laid upon him. Have I dealt with that? No, not at all. So how can I compare to the sufferings of Christ? How can I become a partaker of those sufferings? Because I don't compare at all. I like what one uh, pastor wrote concerning um, this truth. His name was Joseph Thiessen. He's a Romanian pastor who stood up to repression towards Christianity. He said, the union with Christ is the most beautiful subject in the Christian life. It means that I am not a lone fighter here. I am an extension of Jesus Christ. When I was beaten in Romania, he suffered in my body. That is not my suffering. I only had the honor to share in his sufferings. See, what he was saying was, because I stood up for the gospel, because I lived the gospel message, because I believed this and I applied it to my life, I was persecuted. But it wasn't I who was persecuted because I'm just an extension of Christ in me. And so in reality, it's Christ being persecuted. And my body was used to suffer for Christ's sake. And so in a sense, I can 
sense the sufferings of Christ and be a partaker of that suffering. Spurgeon said, if you do not share in Christ's humiliation, how can you expect to share in his exaltation? We need to share in the sufferings of Christ and understand that in this world we shall suffer as he suffered. We shall receive reproach as he was reproached. And if they speak evil of him, they will speak evil of us. And thus we share in a little bit of that suffering, right? He said, to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering. Not, not the full suffering, but an extent of it. Part of it. What a privilege and what an honor that is, right? To suffer for Christ, for the gospel's sake. Next week we'll get into more of this suffering, but Peter will talk about how Christians suffer for the wrong reasons because they're doing the wrong things. And so because of their own dumb mistakes, because they're not living for God and they're, they're, they're living for themselves and they're selfish and they're suffering, you can't blame Christ for that. Only for living for Christ. What's another reason for suffering? How about for comforting others? Do we suffer to comfort others? Yes, we do. By the comfort that we find. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. Mercies, God's mercies, he's given them to us. He's the God of all comfort, Paul said. He comforts us while we're in trouble, while we're suffering. It is him who comforts us. How does he do that? By the relationship that we have with him. I have laid in bed in so much pain and yet Christ has come and comforted me in that pain. And knowing that the pain's still there, the injury's still there, but knowing that Christ has not left me. Christ is still with me and there's a purpose for the pain. There's a purpose for that suffering. And that's comforting. It was comforting for me to know that my Savior suffered as I suffered and that my suffering is not eternal. It's temporal. It's only for a while. And so I can rest assured that one day God will remove me from this deteriorating body and give me a new body and there will be no more suffering, no more pain, no more tears. And I'm comforted by that. I'm encouraged by that. Though I still suffer, I'm comforted by the Lord. Paul also said, who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So we suffer also so that when we receive comfort from the Lord, we then can give others comfort from the Lord. So the reason that you're suffering may be because God has given you comfort so that you can comfort others. You know, I've seen people who have had cancer or some disease and they come to church for that reason, because they're sick, they have no more hope, they, they've exhausted all resources, and so who are they trusting in now? Okay, let's go to God, because he's the guy that has all the answers, he can heal me. So they come to church, and they get all this comfort from the body of Christ, and it's just poured upon them. And what is sad is that when they get healed by the Lord or the doctors and it's all gone, they walk away as though it never happened. They never do anything with it. They leave the church, they leave the relationship, they start their life over where they left off, and they think this is wonderful, God is so good, and yet they're living without God to this day. That is such a sad thing, because they didn't get this concept, this principle, this doctrine that, that Paul is talking about. Paul is saying, you should have then learned the comfort that was given to you to now comfort others. So when someone else comes into the church that has cancer, that has some disease, some lung problem, you know, then you can go to them, pray for them, understand their feelings, their emotions, and comfort them by the comfort that you receive from the Lord. That's how it works. That's the body of Christ as we suffer together in this world. That is the doctrine of suffering. He goes on and says, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, that is Paul, he's talking personally now. So Paul's saying, I suffered too. I suffered as an example. So as an example, I am suffering and I know that you're suffering. And so our consolation or our comfort that God has given us also abounds through Christ. Now if we are afflicted, again, speaking personally, Paul says, if I'm afflicted, it is for your comfort. 
and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same suffering which we also suffer. I find that to be true. My, my, my injury, which seems to be permanent, and it, the pain is up and down, depending on what I do, you know, it has kept me humble so that I can comfort others because I understand their pain. So when someone says, I've got this pain, I'm like, oh, I know what you mean. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean because I get it too. You know, and so it's, it's not like a, a young person who's perfectly healthy and someone says, I've got this pain. Oh, good, I'll pray for you. And then they're off because they don't understand the pain. They never had the pain or that kind of pain. They never had to endure it, never had to call on God, you know. And so they don't understand that because they're healthy. And so there's something said about suffering that's good for others and not just for us. And so Peter goes on and says, Rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed. Now let me stop there for a second because he's talking about Jesus here. And he's talking about the end time events, when the end of all things is at hand. Look at verse 7 again. The end of all things is at hand. It's coming to an end. The signs are there. And so when everything is done, when Jesus returns in his glory, when he is revealed and we see these signs taking place. And so we should be looking up. We just had two earthquakes, one in La Habra and one in Roland Heights. <clears throat> I grew up in Roland Heights, so that one interested me. And there was a street in Nogales. And I remember walking as a little kid along this block wall where the, whole, the top of the block wall just fell over onto the sidewalk. So I took, took those pictures, copied it, and I put it into my Facebook and I wrote the scripture there from Mark you know, about the signs of the end, that nation will rise against nation. And I, I almost wanted to put in parentheses Russia against Ukraine, you know, and then, and then uh, you know, the uh, Israel against Iran. And then there will be various earthquakes, and I wanted to put La Habra and Rolling Heights in there, you know. And, and so I said, hey, the end, you know, events are here. We're seeing the signs. And then someone posted, what's new, you know, sarcastically, what's new? What, what, what is new? We, we've had earthquakes before. We've had nation rise against nation. So what is new? And so then I reposted on there. I said, well, we have more earthquakes today than ever before. A hundred times more than we had a thousand years ago. And we're having a more and more increasing in intensity and in number daily. So that's different. That's new. Israel became a nation in 1948. God took a nation that was scattered around the world and he brought it back together with their own original language. That's new. That's new. And it says in the end times, people will be, um, what's the word? Numbed to the signs of the end. And that was reference to that person that wrote that. And I said, and that's new because people are numb to it. They're asking questions like, what's new? And, and that's sad because that is one of the signs that people be, will be indifferent to the signs of the last days. We're seeing it. It's so clear. <clears throat> Israel just cleared out all their in, in, embassies throughout the world. They just told all their people, come home. Why? Why would they do that? Well, they said it's because they're, they're on strike. Uh, the uh, people in the embassies want more money. That's the excuse they use, so they brought them all home. So they're all cleared. Why are they all cleared? They just spent a little over $2 billion to beef up their military to prepare for an attack upon Iran because Iran is building a nuclear power plant and possibly a weapon to attack Israel. $2 billion, that's a lot of money. Why are they doing that? Russia is going into Ukraine. Russia has helped Iran build these nuclear plants and they're building a second one already. Israel has a wealth of gas supplies. Russia wants that wealth. Magog and Gog scenario, Ezekiel 37, 8, and 9, is about Russia, Iran, going into Israel. These are signs, and they're everywhere. And Peter is saying here, rejoice, rejoice, because his glory is being revealed. The second coming of Christ is declared. That 70th week that Daniel spoke about, that great tribulation period, when the second coming of Christ comes, not the rapture, the rapture is when we're caught up in the air with Jesus Christ. The second coming is when Christ comes down to the earth and destroys it with just the word of his mouth. 
Amazing power. When that happens, Paul, Peter said, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. That day we will be rejoicing, we will be cheering, we will be jumping up and down because it, we know the end is done. There will be no more pain, no more suffering in this world. Our sins will be dealt with. I, I, I can't wait for that day that I can stand before God and be sinless and not have this separation because of my sin. Right now I have it and I come to God and I've got to confess them before I even speak to Him because they're in the way. But that day when I can see God face to face and not have to worry about the sin that I just committed, the sin that I just thought about, that'll be a glorious day. A day of rejoicing, as Peter says here, because the end is drawing near. Back in World War II, you remember the rejoicing that took place when that war was over? It, It was almost in a sense that they forgot the pain, they forgot the suffering, and they were rejoicing. Times Square is a famous picture of that that sailor and that woman kissing there, you know, when it was all over, you know, that's the type of rejoicing that's going to take place in heaven when everything is done and over. And at that instance, all pain and suffering will be gone and forgotten. Isn't that amazing how you can forget pain? You know, I I can remember when my sciatic uh, was damaged and I had so much pain that you can't cry. So tears just flow because it, the pain is just that bad. And you're taking Percocet, you know, two, two every four hours, you know, just trying to keep the pain down. And that, that's pretty bad. And yet today, I can remember the pain, but I don't really remember it. You know, it's almost like a, a fog because I'm not there anymore. We forget pain really fast. And I think that's why Paul said that we can't compare the pains and sufferings of today with the glory that awaits us in heaven. He said that in Romans 8.18. It says, I consider that all sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us. When we get there, we're going to forget all the pain and suffering that we've gone through because we're in heaven. And there's so many glories awaiting us. Heaven is awaiting us. Our home is awaiting us. The perfect body is awaiting us. Eternal life is awaiting us. Again, as I said earlier, that sin that separates us from God, that will be done away with. That will be glorious. We'll receive rewards for the things that we've done here upon this earth. And we will be fellow heirs with Jesus Christ in the heavenly realms. And so Peter says, from suffering to glory to rejoicing, to rejoicing. From suffering to glory to rejoicing. Let me close with this. We all suffer. We all have fiery trials. Let us keep our eyes on the Lord. Keep our eyes on the glory of God that awaits us. For what awaits us is far better than what we're enduring at this moment. Yes, sin, Adam's sin, brought suffering, death to this world. But it's Jesus Christ who brought the grace and peace and the life into our lives. Romans 8, as Paul said again, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed to us when we stand before him. Have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you given him your heart? You know, we live in America and everyone's a believer. If I to ask you, do you believe in Jesus Christ? You'd say, yeah. If I were to ask you, are you a Christian? You'd probably say, yeah. But the question is, are you? Paul tells us in Corinthians 15 that we're to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith or not. How do I know if I'm a believer? How do I examine myself? Are you living in sin? Are you living in sin? Then you're not a believer if you're living in sin. If you're practicing sin, the Bible says you're not inherit the kingdom of God. The Bible says if you lie... If you lie, there's forgiveness. But if you're lying and continue to lie, there is no forgiveness for you because you're not born again. But I'm a Christian. Isn't that all it takes? No. It takes being a new creature in Christ Jesus. You need to be born again. You need to repent from your sins. You need to turn from them. And you need to walk in a new way. God wants us to walk in light of his word. 
and his word is pure and holy and he is pure and holy and we need to approach him in holiness and that holiness only comes through Christ Jesus who dwells within us who changes us see because the nature of a Christian never changes it's always the same and it's the same nature that I have that you have that we all have together it's the nature of Christ if you were to plant an apple tree in your garden do you expect lemons to come out of it then guess what it's not an apple tree if you get avocados is it an apple tree no if you get peaches it's not an apple tree mangoes not an apple tree prunes not an apple tree you might be a prune but not an apple tree right an apple tree will give you apples a christian will give you christian fruit now but what if the wind blows i thought about this what if the wind blows in that tree and that tree starts bouncing all over the place you know and you then you gotta go out there stake it tie it because you're tired of seeing it going all over the place guess what Will it give you lemons then? No, it still gives you apples. And if the sun shines on it and burns it and the leaves start to wither and dry up, you know, and you're going, oh no, my poor tree, I need to water it. Well then, will it give you lemons? No, it gives you apples because it's an apple tree. So no matter what goes on around an apple tree, it's an apple tree. Same with the Christian. No matter what happens in their life, no matter what situation they're in, they will have fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5, that love, joy, peace. Those are fruits of the Spirit that are there, that are constant for all of us as believers. If you don't have that, then you're not a Christian. You're not a believer. And you need to repent from your sins, from your lying, from your cheating, from your adultery acts, from your mind. You know, they're, they're showing this movie Noah right now, right? And from what I'm understanding, it, it has no resemblance whatsoever to scriptures at all because in scriptures it talks about humanity's thoughts were so corrupt that God had to deal with it and we're in that place today that our thoughts are so corrupt look at pornography in the world today worldwide you can get it any time of the day on your iPhone if that's what you want and it's there and that is not what a Christian does it's not the fruit of the spirit we need to repent from that Turn to God and begin to live a pure life before him. A life that would reflect Christ and his nature. So I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning as we bow our heads. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because raising your hand doesn't do it. I'm asking you to be honest with God. It's between you and him, not even me. It's your heart laid out before him. And it's only up to you that you're sincere with God. He sees all things. He knows all things. And you need to be sincere with him. And it's simple. Lord, I'm a sinner. Just acknowledging that. Lord, I have sinned. You know the areas I've sinned, Lord. And I want to hand those over to you right now. And I choose today to follow you. I choose today to get into your word to find what truth is, and to live it out in my life, Lord. Would you help me? Would you be my God? And then would you give me the fruit that would reveal to me the evidence that I am a Christian, that I do love you, because I do believe in Jesus Christ and that he resurrected from the dead, and he ascended unto the Father, and he's sitting at the right hand of God, and that he is God. I believe all that. And now, Lord, make my life reflect it. In Jesus' name we pray.